wonderful to see a full room and everybody back together. Uh, we had this uh, meeting in February, you know, the smaller partner meeting, and then we said this was such a special moment. We really want to do an event. And when we signed the contract with uh, with a hotel in in June, you know, it was not clear how travel will look like and all the situation. But we said we definitely want to do this. So after the keynotes, you know, we want to have two panels now very concrete. One is on uh, the status of the energy transition, where we now look with uh, the colleagues on um, the leading countries for the energy transition here, um, on, on where we stand, and obviously now what uh, um, the plan is for this decade. And then the second one is on concrete projects. So looking back, it's just a very brief impulse presentation to to see DI has been found in 2009, where we stand today. And uh, I think the most important thing is um, today, and nobody would have expected this, um, you know, we really have in operation with great output, uh, some of the largest solar and wind farms globally with the lowest prices. And these have been actually commercial projects, you know, that has been reverse bidding mainly of governments, no, feed in tariffs like in Europe. So uh, this has been a development which really surprised many of us. And we can uh, look at this and we can probably be much more bullish for this decade what to expect. Um, and obviously it's not only about solar here in the region and we've been pointing out that the region enjoys among the best global wind resources as well, which is uh, very important by the way for green molecules, you know, we look first at wind for higher capacity factor and combine this with solar. And then, um, well, of course, it's uh, this great joint resources, you know, sometimes even intraday seasonally perfectly complementary between solar and wind, which allows combined capacity factors of 70% uh, in places like Neom, in places like Morocco or Egypt. So a lot of things have happened, actually much more than the greatest optimist would have expected. Um, and even all the countries, they drew up massive plans. So we don't have a shortage of big plans. Look at the Recre report. Uh, every single country has uh, huge ambitious plans, but there I would be a little bit more critical because uh, execution is in some countries really uh, close to zero and execution is very slow and delayed. So this is probably a little bit, um, and I will come to this where we need to accelerate. Now, this is, many of you have followed DI over the years, and uh, some of you have been in Berlin in 2012, nine years ago, when we launched Desert Power 2050. At the time, we had quite optimistic assumptions underpinned by the industry. So we said um, solar PV can go down up to 70% by, um, well, over the next few decades until 2050. Um, onshore wind has a significant uh, cost reduction uh, potential offshore. And uh, at the time, these uh, estimates, they were co considered relatively bullish. Now, I didn't cross out CSP, but this is where we land today with PV. So what we thought could be achieved in 2050 uh, actually was achieved by the market in 2020 and actually significantly overachieved. So just uh, look at this only number and it's very impressive. And onshore wind um, should have been there is, uh, is probably somewhere there, minus 50%. This is just uh, amazing and referring to Frank's presentation on tipping points, and we've discussed this with Tony Saber many times. You can watch uh, the YouTube videos on uh, tipping points. They're really powerful. And what happens once a certain technology gets 3% market share. So this is just uh, to show you the minus 85% on a levelized cost of electricity. That's the uh, ARENA cost database. And uh, this is um, just on solar, but on wind, we have a similar kind of trend. And this is actually just over the last few years. And as Paul mentioned, uh, the big um, tipping point was here on the tariff side, the 5.85 cent um, MBR2. I'll show a photo of the part uh, in just a second. So uh, then we went down to one cent solar at the start of the year. And uh, um, one thing always to keep in mind that these tariffs are not strictly comparable. 
not even tariffs within Saudi Arabia are comparable. Um, and there's many factors for this. There's obviously uh, varying um, solar yields, but sometimes grid is included, sometimes not. Um, there is uh, factors uh, massively distorting. Uh, even the PPAs uh, in the UAE, for example, between Dubai and Abu Dhabi, they're different. In Dubai, you have a flat rate PPA, while in Abu Dhabi, you know, you have a multiplier in summer. So keep this in mind. Tariffs are never strictly comparable. It's just for the trend. It's just a range. We are today at one to two cents solar in the region and at uh, one and a half, two to three cent wind. And this is just amazing. You know, this gives the potential really to massively accelerate the energy transition. This is from the DI project database. We are going towards 20 gigawatts of installed capacity. Only in the UAE, we will be at 6.5 gigawatt solar at the end of next year. This is really massive. So um, just to show a few projects. So this is really today. This is uh, um, Aqua Power 50 megawatt in Jordan. This is uh, um, in uh, um, Sakaka. This is also very interesting because this is the first privately financed wind park, uh, 120 megawatt in Morocco where the three main PPAs are with uh, salmon plants as an off-taker. So even new kind of models, you know, with uh, private, private PPAs, uh, they are pioneered. This I'm specifically uh, proud of my friend Faisal. He just came today. He's commissioning this week 250 megawatt uh, wind in Egypt and built through the pandemic. So I think this is an amazing achievement. And I, I, I think it shows what is possible even in difficult times. So that's um, the Lekela project. And this is uh, the Mohammed bin Rashid Maktoum Solar Park in Al-Qudra. And this is uh, the first 13 megawatt. I remember I was in the inauguration in 2013. And this is 200 megawatt. Um, actually, the 200 megawatt is small now because there's 1,100 megawatt operating. There will be 700 additional CSP and much more PV um, commissioned between this and next year. You can go cycling there. And there's the first green hydrogen project operating in the entire MENA region, operating today. So this is really impressive. So just uh, to kickstart the panel, I have um, a few statements here that can maybe um, be a subject of the discussion as well. So one to two cent solar, two to three cent wind, uh, this is a reality today. It doesn't matter, you know, that we are in a phase of unprecedented temporary price increase was a perfect storm, you know, on the PV side, raw material increases of uh, uh, logistic costs, uh, even, you know, bottlenecks um, on um, availability. Uh, the same uh, actually feeds through the wind chain, you know, raw material prices, actually even for electrolysis. So this is applicable across the value chain and um, PV, uh, particularly projects have been postponed, even canceled. Uh, this is a temporary challenge. Um, in a phase of uh, net zero, Dubai came out um, with the UAE announcing um, net zero by 2050 just a few weeks ago, shortly after Saudi followed uh, net zero 2050, Aram uh, 2060, Aramco 2050, um, and uh, um, Bahrain as well, net zero 2060. So that's very important. Um, I think in such a scenario, uh, it is really not possible to justify fossil fuels again. Um, also, nobody would have expected that uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, they start phasing out fossil fuels quite dramatically. So hopefully this will be completed. A uh, country like Egypt is on advanced phase. The UAE completely phase out fossil fuels. Fossil fuels have always been the most unfair thing, particularly from a social point of view, but encourage the waste. And this needs to be stopped now. And also carbon will have a price. Green molecules, um, is, uh, you know, the, the elephant in the room is the enabler actually now to accelerate the energy transition. Um, you know, when we started five years ago with um, green molecules, people, they still laughed at us. Uh, we presented with Frank and, uh, and Adrian Weig, the hydrogen manifesto in Berlin two years ago, uh, and which led to the launch of the MENA Hydrogen Alliance. But uh, this has become a big topic. Why? Because it's so complementary. Green electrons are prerequisite. You know, you can store seasonally potentially. You can shift, you can move energy between continents at much higher amounts and the whole flexibility of green molecules, you know, to, 
the decarbonized industries such as uh, steel fertilizers uh, that's very powerful and we will see projects uh, where we, single projects are bigger than entire energy systems of certain countries and the panel after uh, this we actually hear one of them so um stranded asset risk that's uh, that's a big big problem um and uh, we've seen in the german energy transition quite uh, dramatic developments watch this out there will be more and more also i think uh, very positive technology enables it but increased uh, transparency there is a scrutiny that you know on the entire emission balance of value chains so um uh, you know you cannot hide anywhere here and say uh, this this is green greenwashing so greenwashing will be increasingly difficult and the last point is really on a revolution in the financial sector my background is banking and uh, i've overseen um, at the financial crisis uh, at the time um, 7 billion euros is not a big amount but uh, you know when first uh, money market funds started to explode with uh, subprime products uh, i had a hard time and you know, I know when people like El Gore, they're talking about uh, 22 trillion subprime carbon bubble. You know, uh, nobody would have expected that big oil companies, uh, they are sued successfully to accelerate the transition. Um, they are attacked by hedge funds now, like German energy utility companies, which have been divided. Uh, this is a new world here. Um, boardroom uh, fights, you know, with an American uh, oil company you well know where investors pointing on ESG replaced um, to, um, to board members. Uh, this is quite dramatic. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, things can be really challenges and then revaluation is fast and brutal. So be prepared for increased uh, volatility. So that's just on my um, false presentation. Um, let's uh, focus the discussion on opportunities for this decade. The opportunities are huge. You've seen our report, you've, you have it on your table. We did this with our partners, Roland Berger, almost a million jobs in three GCC countries, you know, massive socioeconomic benefits. Um, it's about entrepreneurship. I've been an active angel investor here in the UE for the last five, six years and saw an ecosystem being created. You know, I want to see the next uh, Tesla, the next uh, um, Amazon or whatever, be a climate tech company coming out of the UAE, coming out of Saudi. We've launched Saudi angel investors. You know, it's possible. Um, the region has all the potential. Actually, I want to see not only one, I want to see many uh, of such uh, success stories coming out of here. And this is really the imperative, diversifying the economies, um, creating the jobs in future proof industries. Um, and it's not only about low emission, it's really about stability prosperity and uh, you might have seen our report on geopolitical implications so i think who doesn't move and the pioneers will be rewarded will be left out and it can be quite nasty when you're not on the winning track when you're not on the right uh, strategy for the future there will be quite a brutal but in a positive sense